wish all of you a happy Easter here in London. I just flew in from the U.S., about a six-hour flight, and thank God everything was more or less on time, so it's not too late here. A 9.30 Mass on Easter Sunday. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1. Brethren, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new paste, as you are unleavened. For Christ our Pasch is sacrificed. Therefore let us feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Holy Gospel from St. Mark, chapter 16. At that time, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought the sweet spices that coming they might anoint Jesus. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre, the sun being now risen, and they said one to another, Who shall roll back the stone from the door of the sepulchre? In looking, they saw the stone rolled back, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed with a white robe. And they were astonished, who saith to them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he told you. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So for many people in the world, Easter Sunday ends tonight, the Easter season. But it's, in fact, it's a 50 days. It goes all the way to Pentecost. So I wish all of you all the graces and joy and the fruit of the redemption from this beautiful Easter feast. 40 days of fasting, 50 days of feasting in innocence and holiness, chastity, purity, and thirst for the love of God, and feasting on every day, as in Lent there was an epistle and gospel every day. So during Easter time, certainly in these next eight days of the octave, every day there's a whole feast, and, and the apparitions of Christ, that he appeared to various apostles and the women and disciples at one point he, he appeared to 500 at once a crowd of 500 newly born catholics and our lord appeared to them and blessed them and walked among them as they kissed his sacred wounds in his glorified body so mary saint mary magdalene she's a special soul why because after Our Lady, she's the first to see our Lord. And you might say, why her? Why her? She's the big sinner. Why her? Well, that's precisely why. She was a sinner, and our Lord came for sinners. And to show that, he chose St. Mary Magdalene to be the first to see him after Our Lady. And also to reward her intense love. Her love brought her to the tomb. She came with the other two Marys. They had various obstacles. One, the big stone. Two, the sealed stone. It was sealed with chains and bolted with the seal, probably of Rome or of the synagogue. And then the guards. So these women, it shows their beautiful devotion and how... how they just wanted to love our Lord and take care of him, although they did lose the faith. And that's why you don't find the Virgin Mary among those Marys going there on Easter morning. Our Lady's not there because she, 
She knew he wouldn't be there. She knew he would rise from the dead. So at three in the morning today, our Lord appeared first to Our Lady. Second to Mary Magdalene. Again, why Mary Magdalene? Because our Lord came to call sinners, firstly. Second, to reward her love, because her love was very intense. And she sinned greatly, but she repented greatly. Just as you take a tennis ball, when you strike it on the ground as hard as you can, the harder it hits the ground, the higher it bounces up. And that's what our Lord wants from big sinners. They might fall and fall big, but if they bounce high by repentance and love of God, they can make reparation for their past. And that happened with Mary Magdalene. So there she is at the tomb weeping because she finds the tomb empty and she doesn't know. She sees the young man, the angel, appearing in dazzling white garments. And the angel just tells her, look at the empty tomb. Why are, you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's risen. And then another time, Mary Magdalene will come back weeping. And then our Lord will come dressed, appearing as a gardener. She mistakes him for the gardener. And our Lord tells her, Maria, quid ploras? Mary, why are you weeping? Why do you weep, woman? And she says, she says, they've taken away the body. I don't know where they put our Lord. Tell me where you took him, and I will take him and bury him. So you see, St. Gregory the Great praises St. Mary Magdalene because she's willing to go all through the city looking for her beloved. She's willing to go anywhere to find her beloved. And this shows what our souls should be like towards God. Always seeking God, always thirsting for him always wanting to be united more and more to him. And when we feel like, like he repels us because of the many crosses he might give us, and the splinters of the cross dig in, and it's not pleasant, that's actually God working deeply in the soul, purifying the soul, drawing that soul closer and closer to him. And that's why living in times of persecution, as we are now with modernist Rome persecuting tradition, punishing tradition, and then the, the governments joining with the synagogue of Satan, more and more increasing their persecution on the Catholic Church, on tradition especially. All this is a blessing to live through because it requires us to fight. It makes us in a position to, to always be battling, always be fighting for the faith. It just won't fall on our lap, as you know. <laughs> It doesn't fall on our lap. And we got to fight for the faith. Just like the beautiful martyrs of England who came to London dressed in disguise, coming in from Douai Reims Seminary in France. They came in disguise to say Mass, just like this in homes all throughout the 15 and 1600s in terrible persecutions. And those good Catholic faithful who were faithful to tradition, who were the real Catholic resistance of that time, God raised up great saints out of them. Not only the priests, but good men like uh, St. Nicholas Owens, who was the carpenter that built the hiding holes, and St. Margaret Clitheroe, who, uh, who, who held, took the priest in her house to have Mass at the risk of her life. And indeed, she would die for it. She would be crushed to death at the York Bridge. And also St. Margaret Ward and St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher. St. John Fisher, the only resistance Catholic bishop that spoke loud and clear against the schism of Henry VIII and his divorce, which was illegal. He's the only one that raised his voice and it cost him his head. But he took flight straight to heaven. So it is a blessing we can't forget. It was a blessing to live in a time of persecution. It's no fun. We would dream of Catholic ages and Latin Mass everywhere on our corners and priests preaching the true faith and a good Pope like Pius X in the throne. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We dream of those days. We really do. We long for the recovery of our glorious Catholic Church. But in the meantime, our Lord wants us fighting. He wants us in the trenches, 
with the bullets flying past our ears and bombs and mines in the grounds. And as the Psalms say, a thousand fall to my right and a hundred fall to my left. And if we're not careful and we don't pray and we're not watchful, we can also be hit and lose the faith. So we must be humble and pray and be close to the Mother of God. <clears throat> And then also St. Mary Magdalene, she is chosen to be the first because a woman brought death to the human race, Eve, and it would be the great woman, the Virgin Mary, who will bring life by grace, by being mother of God. But our Lord will also choose a woman to be the apostle to the apostles because our first bishops and our first pope, they lost the faith. They really lost the faith. They betrayed our Lord. And one of them hanged himself for selling him for 30 pieces of silver. So to humble the pride of <clears throat> the clergyman, our Lord takes a previously sinful woman converted to become <clears throat> the brave soul to announce to them the resurrection. I have seen the empty tomb. St. Peter and St. John, they can't believe it. They go sprinting back to the tomb. And as soon as St. John, the, the, the pure and virgin soul, sees the deflated shroud, <clears throat> because he was there to wrap Christ's body, he instantly fell to his knees and recovered the faith and, and said, he's risen from the dead. <clears throat> And then St. Mary Magdalene, she becomes the Apostle to the Apostles. And notice again the tender words of our Lord. He mentions Peter by name. Because right now Peter is in, in the dumps. He's in the bottom of the dumps of dumps. He is, he's lost the faith. He is lost. He is in the throes of the worst depression one could be in. And he hears the message from St. Mary Magdalene. Peter, he mentioned you by name. And St. Vincent Ferris says something interesting here. He says it gives Peter hope because our Lord is basically telling him, Peter, you're forgiven from your contrition. You have perfect contrition. You're sorry for offending God, and I know that. And I've already forgiven you, Peter, with your tears. You've already been washed of your sin. So you don't, you don't lose my friendship, because you recovered it by repentance. And this is the Catholic teaching on perfect contrition, which we should try to do every day, and especially if we fall in sin without availability of confession. So what a wonderful tenderness of the Sacred Heart. And also it shows Peter doesn't lose his rank. Peter is named specifically because he is the monarch of the church. He is the chief of the apostles. Even though he has fallen, our Lord recalls him to repentance. So that message coming from Christ's own mouth, from Mary Magdalene, mentioning Peter, Peter recovers. And Our Lady welcomes him warmly back as he comes back to the door of the cenacle, knocking where Our Lady is, and the Apostles are gathering after they have all kind of scattered. And Peter comes back like a, like kind of like a puppy with his tail between his legs and his ears down. He's truly humbled, and he goes straight to the Virgin Mary and weeps for betraying our Lord. He hears that message of St. Mary Magdalene, and he, the spark of love and fire is rekindled. But Peter doesn't yet believe when he sees the empty tomb. He doesn't yet believe. He will only fully believe when he sees Christ on Easter Sunday and touches wounds like the other apostles in St. Thomas next week. So see how our Lord uh, calls St. Mary Magdalene. And the last point with St. Mary Magdalene, where sin abounded, she sinned much, grace did more abound. Where sin abounded, grace did more abound, says the Holy Ghost. So as much as the fallen human race and, and individuals may fall, grace can pick up the lowest sinners 
the one stuck is stuck in the most bottom part of this, the mud pit. Our Lord's grace calls them all to his mercy, to his grace, because he is glorified by washing away the repentant sinners. He is glorified by showing mercy who? To who? To the miserable. To the miserable. And let's, last point, let's look again at our Blessed Virgin Mary. It's, it's incredible to think that the Blessed Virgin Mary surpassed St. Mary Magdalene in humility. St. Mary Magdalene had all the sins, but she wasn't even close to humility the way Our Lady was. And yet Our Lady was sinless. She was pure without sin, not even the slightest imperfection never stained by the breath or the claws of Satan. Yet we were all born in his claws by original sin. So we all have reason to be extremely humble of heart. But Our Lady surpasses all of us in humility of heart. And humility is that foundation on which all the other virtues build. So let's learn from Our Lady, run to her, to give us a strong faith in this age of apostasy. Archbishop Lefebvre did call in one of his sermons in 1986, he did call these days apocalyptic times, with Rome burning incense to Buddhists and to Pacamama. He said these are apocalyptic days that Rome can lose the faith and become in the grip of, uh, of apostasy. And he called it that apostasy. With its new bastard mass, its bastard priesthood, and its bastard rites and bastard sacraments. How much clearer can a bishop speak? And he warned all of his priests and the faithful, any priest who wants to keep the Catholic faith, he must separate himself from this conciliar church. And to the liberal new SSPX, these are scandalous words. You know, it sounds schismatic, but it's truthful. We don't want to be schismatic. We're not schismatic. <clears throat> but who's schismatic? It's those who depart from the Catholic tradition. Those who part, depart from the Catholic Mass and the traditional sacraments. And those are the schismatics. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre could say, when Rome does come back to tradition, and she will, we have the promise of our Lord and Our Lady. But when Rome does come back to tradition, it won't be us coming back to Rome and us coming back to the church, it'll be those who have left it for the conciliar church coming back to the Catholic Church. And that's why it's very dangerous with the, the um, Bishop Fillet and the liberal movement in the new SSPX blurring the lines, no more calling it the conciliar church and the Catholic Church. It's very dangerous. Archbishop Lefebvre spoke clearly, and it was clear. One's an enemy, that's bad, stay away. One is good, embrace it with all our heart and stay with tradition. But once you blur the lines, you're in a state of confusion, and the devil just re wreaks havoc. Because the devil loves to work in confusion. And modernists, St. Pius X said that about the modernists. Their, their verbiage, their language is ambiguous and double meaning, and God in the Holy Ghost says in Scripture, I have hated, I have detested the double-tongued. And modernism lives in that, that nursery of confusion and ambiguity. And that sort of language already condemns Vatican II. It already condemns it. Pius VI condemned it in Autorum Fidei. The use of that kind of language already condemns the main documents of Vatican II. So let's look at our beautiful champions of the faith here in England. Saint Edmund Campion, Saint Robert Southwell, Father John Gerard, the great Jesuits who were here, the great Franciscan priest Father Thomas Abel, who was imprisoned and prophesied the terrible death of Henry VIII, that the dogs would come and lick his blood. And that happened when he was in the Westminster Cathedral, his body burst in the coffin and blood dripped, seeped down out of the coffin. And dogs came in off the streets and started licking his blood. Horrible scene. But 
It was foretold by the great Franciscan priest, St. Thomas Abel, who was beheaded by him. And think of all the Carthusian monks and holy monks who were brought to death. St. Richard Whiting, who was led through the streets and then hanged, drawn, and quartered. He was the abbot of Glastonbury in the monastery. He was hanged on the Tor, the famous hill, the Tor, T-H-O-R. So let's pray to all these martyrs. Pray to all these great saints, because they have the same faith we profess. And they would tell us, don't you dare compromise with Vatican II and the New Mass. Don't you dare imitate those traitors who compromise with error. And our, our Archbishop Lefebvre himself warned us of this. So on this beautiful Easter Sunday, in this octave and 50 days of Easter, let us recover the faith, a strengthening of the faith, by turning to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She never lost the faith. She's the beautiful dove. She's that beautiful tower of David that would not budge, but stood at the foot of the cross, and yet she suffered everything. And St. Bernard says it was a miracle that she did not die at the foot of the cross. It was a miracle of God, a true miracle. And it was also a miracle that Christ didn't die after the scourging. So these miracles shout the, the glory of Christ, his divinity, as well as the earthquake. And the earthquake on his death showed the mourning of the earth, the sadness of the earth, rebelling against man, killing our God. But on the morning of the resurrection, there was also a tremendous earthquake that set the Roman guards into fear. And when they saw the angel, they didn't see the angel, but they saw the rock lift off and be thrown down, and the angel sat on it. Then they saw the angel, as if to strike them dead with his fiery sword. And that's why they were struck with fear, paralyzed to the ground. These Roman soldiers paid by the Jews to watch a dead body. And what happened was the synagogue of Satan, the bankers, paid for the first witnesses of the resurrection because they came running back and said, there were no apostles that stole the body. We were there and we were awake. And we can't explain it, but this huge light came out of that tomb. The rock was lifted up and thrown down and this angel sat on it and nearly looked like he would slice us in half. That was the report. So the Jews... What did they do? They paid them more money, extra money, to tell when you go out to the bars, just say nothing about it and just say the body was stolen. But every Roman guard knows if you're sleeping on the job, you get executed. That's how serious it was to sleep on duty. So the Romans, they took the money, but they didn't say much. But some of them actually converted. And we know St. Longinus became Catholic and a martyr for the faith. So let's turn to the Virgin Mary. Let's gather around her, always her, the Virgin Mary, always Our Lady. She's the woman of the book of Genesis. She's the woman of the apocalypse, the woman crowned with 12 stars and the moon under her feet and the moon and the clothed with the sun. And that's the image of the miraculous medal. It's Our Lady of Genesis stepping on the serpent and then on the, on the reverse side, she's the Lady of the Apocalypse. So the miraculous medal is full of deep meaning and it's good to pass that out to people who otherwise can care less. Let's beg Our Lady the grace of perseverance, of clarity, of doctrine, strength in the faith and to live according to it always in the charity like St. Mary Magdalene and in the state of grace. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for pray us and have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us and have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us and have recourse to thee. For those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.